Good afternoon, everybody. It's Saturday afternoon for your afternoon or early evening update, as it were, live from the McKinley Fire Command Center here in Willow, Alaska. Kill Casey, your host. And here's what we have going on. The winds did stay overhead today, so it did not impact the fire area. We can safely say that now that it's getting into the early evening. That is fantastic news. We've had a lot of folks come in here from the community and say how grateful they are that those winds stayed above. They were there, but the inversion stayed over the fire area enough of the day that when they did mix, the meteorologist Mark said they were only about eight miles an hour. And eight miles an hour for us is fine. We can still be on our offensive and fight fire with that type of wind freeze. So today, the crews are linking all the parts and pieces together on this fire line. And what I mean by that is that early on in the aftermath of the initial blow up, we had to prioritize putting the dozers and crews that we had at the highest priority. So on the fire, you'll see different dozer lines that are in strategic places where we had to keep the fire from bulging out and moving into more structures. So as Incident Commander Deputy Tom Kurth, who's working the camera behind me, just said a minute ago, we're linking all the pieces together. So we have over 400 firefighters here now. We had several more hotshot crews in the lower 48 join our efforts today. And hose lays are being linked in ways that they weren't before because we have more hose, we have more pumps, we have more gasoline, we have more firefighters. And so the mop-up and fire line linkage is truly underway in all of its urgency because we can stay on the offensive. We didn't have to pull back today because the wind, and that is really fantastic news. As firefighters, we don't want to work super hard on a piece of line and have to lose it and stand back and build a new one. So for everybody out there working, we're proud of you, keep going. I know that's what the public wants. Here is a line I want to show you over here. This red line you can see is 2019 current. This is our drought meter, our drought index. And our F band, Chris Moore, who you've seen at the community meetings, does these excellent fire behavior analysts and talks. This is uncharted territory now in August. This is the day of the month and week. This is 2004. And now here we are, 2019. We're sailing off into uncharted dry. There's no real rain in the forecast. There's only been maybe a couple sprinkles predicted over the next few days, and then it's supposed to be hot and dry. So again, there are a lot of hazards out there. There's a burn closure. There are, this fire is really resistant to being put out. So if you start a new one, we're gonna have issues. So be really careful about that. When you're anywhere near this impacted area, whether you're sheltering in place or heading back in for whatever your reason is, there's so many hazards right now. We are really concerned that there are issues people don't understand. These ash pits, are everywhere. This morning, the safety officer was uh, hoping that we could flag them. There are so many, there are thousands and thousands of ash pits out there and they're hidden. So if you step into any of these, we wear boots and Nomex and we have very much a system to keep the ash and, and all this out of our boot so we don't get burned. We work very aware of what could happen to us. These boots and these clothes are for a reason. If you get into one of these ash pits, it's going to burn your legs. It could be very serious third degree burns, and sometimes they go all the way up to your hips. There are going to be burning materials still with the trees falling over. There's going to be weeks of tree removal from this whole area, weeks and weeks and weeks. They've been forming the plans as to where they're going to put the trees. Of course, if the trees are on your property, they're your trees, but there's a lot of this land where the trees need to be stacked. So there's going to be lots of work, and these trees keep coming down. There's hazardous materials that are out there. There's a lot of traffic that's doing the looky-loo. And we need you to please help our fire crews by doing that 45 mile an hour speed limit. Even if we get to a place in the next few days where we can get the two lane traffic, that's still gonna be a very 45 mile an hour type mindset. So as you prepare for as we can transition this fire from a one lane to a two lane, which is our hope in the next few days, then you wanna be prepared for more like a construction site. Kind of like how the Sterling Highway was, where you have flaggers everywhere, slowing down for the traffic to get through here. That's kind of looking out, but we'd like to prepare you ahead so that nothing's a surprise to you, our, our audience. We also have the power lines could be down on the side channels or around structures. Fire apparatus are moving all around. Equipment's moving all around. We've ordered a couple excavators. So there's just so many hazards. Everybody in this command post knows them. We're talking about them. We're concerned about them. We had some firefighters down at Swan Lake going to an ash pit. We had a motor vehicle accident on the Sterling Highway involving a public. 
and some of the uh, National Guard, and that's out in the news now. And so these are real concerns of ours. These aren't just theoretical. They're happening, and we want to make sure that nobody here on this corridor gets impacted. The National Guard is still out there. As you say, troopers are still out there. <clears throat> and so th these hazards are real. Tom, what do we have from the audience? So once again, the question is, does that mean we can come back to our homes next week? So the fire team right now, after the wind event, going overhead and us staying on the offensive means a lot of good things for folks looking forward. The discussions for reentry are beginning and moving into a decision point for all these safety hazards. We're going to keep you very well posted on that. That's what we do here. There hasn't been a date and time set, but now that clock starts ticking faster because if we had to fall back today and use our bulldozers and all of our equipment to start establishing new fire lines, that would put a delay on that. And that's the deal we made with you. We've been very transparent. We're not talking around you, we're talking to you. We love these kind of questions. We're not afraid to answer them. The clock is ticking a lot faster. We want to get you back in. The safety analysis is being done, and as soon as we can announce that, we absolutely will. Okay, and then secondary is our guns a hazard, but you might relate that to hunting season and some of the precautions that have been sure, taken so here. That's a really good question. We do have fire personnel working out here. We do know hunters are going in to places and of course, hunting and anytime there's hunting season on, the increased risk of a, a gunshot wound or an injury or an accident goes on. There is the closure in Game Unit 14A for those of you who are out on Moose Camp or thinking about it. If you weren't aware of that, please be aware of that now. 14A Game Unit has a partial closure. That's because of the Deshka fire that is in a similar situation to ours. They're holding the fire lines, they're doing their mop up. That's your quick update on the Deshka to go into it. 2,100 acres, about 210 personnel, and they're out there with that closure near them. And then finally, let's talk a little bit. Somebody wants to know, how do you determine containment? And if we look up into our northeast corner there, we're showing so-called black line up there. Really good question. In fact, I'm gonna invite Tom out here. I'm gonna surprise you all so you can see the face behind the camera because you spent 40 years in this career. And this is always a tricky topic about containment, right? And we're very cautious when we determine containment, which is about this section right here. We call it black line on our maps, which is saying that this fire is not going to move outside of these lines. And that's different from what we're looking at down here, somewhat confinement, where we've only established a very thin line to give us access around there. But the fire has the potential to move out of that area as soon as the weather conditions change that might promote that such that behavior but again containment is when we think this fire will not move outside of that established line thank you tom and anytime we can announce an increase in containment we do we do it every morning if we had it in the evening we would so what the operations folks do is they talk amongst themselves of course is an ongoing practice and then if they need to add some more black line to here we report it to you we'll let you know i know everybody keeps an eye on those numbers for a long time we were at zero then we jumped up to 5%, 10%, 11%, I wouldn't doubt that as these crews work harder and harder, yep. as they get more hose in there, and even use our tools, the drone. Yep. We have our other drone operator down here with the dual camera, infrared, and normal camera, so they can look at some of this and prove it for us. And by the time we're finished here, we're hoping that this line that you're seeing that is red is going to be all black, and the, the very similar perimeter that we have right now will be our end state. And so let's break it down for folks. What could cause this to, to move out of here? You know, most likely in this particular corridor is an increase in the winds and something picking up possibly back here and, and getting momentum so it takes a run at one of these lines and then spots over because right now the spotting potential is pretty high. The rate of spread is almost half an hour or half a mile per hour and so we're still in a situation where we can get rapid rate of spread and really, just like this fire started, it only takes one ignition point. So that's what we want to be on the lookout for and make sure that those pick, don't pick up momentum. Exactly, so to give the public the breakdown, the eight mile an hour range can cause group tree torching and some yep. spotting. Yes. Now, will that push a half mile an hour? Probably not, right? Yep. But it will give us a challenge yep. and make sure that we have our helicopters ready to drop water, a retardant ship if necessary, crews yeah. able to go in that direction. Right. We'll, 
in the best situation, we'll see it, and we can knock that energy or momentum out of it early on. Now, when you think of a tree torching, or candling is another term for it, those particular, just an individual tree may throw out a hundred spots off it. And so keeping that behavior down to a minimum is our job as, you know, air attack and bucket ships and retardant ships and keeping that all on the down low there. Exactly. So I'm going to ask a question that the public might be thinking, because I know I would if I were in the audience. Okay, so when I see those those trees inside of the perimeter of Canlink, I have to worry about that? Well, should we have a wind event, that's the time. Otherwise, you know, these are fairly benign and it, fuel is burning out in these cases. What most likely is happening is these trees are falling over and then as they fall over they find a hot ash pit and they torch off and they make a little ground fire, particularly at night, they're rather spectacular. But by the time we're through, then that tree has burned itself out and that is a good thing. Right, so folks, when you have the interior pockets burning, it can look spectacular, but actually by the time that campfire, if you want to call these individual candling or campfire, once that's burned out, that fuel's out of the game, which is what we need to have happen to have the smoke stop in here. We need to have the fuels burn out. We need to have the rain eventually and the snow following that. And we do know that in the forecast this week, it's looking like a, a moderate to mild week. In fact, tomorrow is supposed to be a lot of cloud cover. 70% cloud 70% cloud, cloud. that'll shade our fuels. Today is a beautiful day in Willow. This evening is a beautiful evening in Willow. And so we'll probably see some increase in smoke off the fire as it sort of warms up throughout the afternoon here. So let's, let's talk one thing while we have public attention, and that is what is the difference between somewhat of a benign torching or candling and a fire that represents a problem. So what you would see in the public is a tree might fall down or a tree might torch out and you'll see this black smoke come up or you'll see an active column come up. Most likely if it's a benign or neutral fire, it's going to die back down again. And so it's a short term event, down it goes, it burned itself out. However, if you see this smoke column pick up, get larger, start to pick up momentum, then that's the kind of identification that we need for early detection there. Right, exactly. So most of the calls that have been coming in are for benign, single or dual tree torching. There's just a lot of trees that have fallen over. And our YouTube channel is something I really want to point you to. We're adding more transparency videos to them as time goes on. In fact, right after this feed, I'm going to go out in the field, get on all my PPE, and go get some more footage for you. We have the drone footage <clears throat> that's a minute and 15 seconds. A lot of you have watched it. You can see all this blowdown. That's just fuel waiting to be either removed by an excavator, a chainsaw, or what have you, because if it stays there for too long, sure. it's eventually going to become... And, and what we're talking about here, though, for size and scope is this is almost 28 miles of perimeter. <laughs> You got another eight miles through the center, and then you got all these side roads too. So there's all sorts of potential to at least witness these uh, burnouts that are occurring. Which is why we've staffed up. Yep. We have all these crews here. We have more uh, crews from Alaska. Uh, the, Fort, uh, the Upper Yukon crew came in. The Koyukuk crew, I believe we have more Alaskan crews on the way to join our lower 48 crews. They're going to be engaged with their full 14 day assignments working hard every single day. So all those signs that people have been putting up on the Parks Highway, the signs at the lodges and in people's driveways, I'll tell you what, that is motivation. It's like fuel for firefighters because they <clears throat> they care a lot about the work that they do and they want to do a good job. They know that the public's scared and, and sometimes doubtful if we can do it, if we can hold this thing right. But they give it their all every day. When they see those signs, <clears throat> it's really, really special. We want to uh, thank you. We want to thank Tom. Thank and you, please Bill. always post your questions. We have our info shop, always looking to see what else we can answer for you. Our mission is to serve you. We want to leave you every day with the ability to somehow reach us through this means. We're going to have public information officers on the Parks Highway tomorrow, up and down. But my staff is finally deep enough that we can really immerse, we call it marinating or meeting you, and we like that. We want to meet you. We'll also be in Talkeetna community meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Very Thanks. good. Thank you.